There is no doubt that the Holy Quran is the first source of the laws and regulations of Islam. This is not to say that the verses in the Holy Quran are not limited just to laws and regulations. Hence, the noble book consists of hundreds of different types of issues which are presented by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and introduced to the Holy Prophet of Islam. But a part of the Quran is said to have consist of 500 verses out of 6,660 verses of the Holy Quran that talks about regulations. This makes it 13% of the Holy Quran which discusses laws and regulations in Islam. However, many individuals believe that the Islamic laws derive from hatred and radicalism. This is why my esteemed guest and I have dedicated tonight's episode to examine the theory of Usul al-Fiqh in light of the Quran. Respected viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the 12th episode of Life from Karbala Ramadan series with me, your host Ahmed Ali. This very controversial topic will be discussed by my, my esteemed guest who has joined me over the past few episodes, Sayyid Hussain Al Qazwini. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyidna. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Uh, Sayyidna, uh, the past 11 episodes or the 11 nights that we have been discussing the topics uh, if you will if you will, can say the most controversial topics which are mentioned in the holy quran um, we varied from infallibility uh, ramadan in the quran and many other topics the respective viewers can check out uh, the channel's youtube uh, page and uh, see all 12 previous episodes uh, but sayyidna uh, somewhat are related Every episode is somewhat related to the next or the previous episode, which makes it very, um, you know, very interesting to watch and very interesting to hear uh, what you have to say. Uh, but for us as Muslims, from the early days of Islam, Muslims have always used the Quran as the prime point or the prime reference to their laws and regulations and what they have to do on a daily basis, whether prayer, fasting, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but some state that usul fiqh is a theory derived, uh, sorry, uh, uh, it's a theory of derived laws or justification of existing laws. So if we can break it down before we get into uh, what jurisprudence is and, and whatnot, uh, if we can talk about what is usul fiqh and what's its important today. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل الله No doubt that um, the science of أصول الفقه if, uh, if we could call it a science because mm. there are some that dispute that yes. it's not a science أصول الفقه which is accepted in both uh, the Sunni school of thought and mm -hmm. the Shia school of thought as a means of deriving Islamic laws. Mm -hmm. No doubt that it exists in both schools of thought yes. and scholars from both schools of thought study, teach, write, research in Usul al-Fiqh. Yes. Usul al-Fiqh literally means the principles of Fiqh. Fiqh means jurisprudence. Yes. So that makes usul al-fiqh the principles of jurisprudence. Meaning that if a person wishes to derive laws, Islamic laws, and not be a muqallid, mm -hmm. not be an emulator of a specific other, scholar, a specific jurist, a specific scholar, in the Sunni school of thought, you would be a muqallid of the four Sunni imams, yes. Abu Hanifa, uh, Hana, Malik ibn, Man, uh, Malik ibn mm -hmm. Anas, uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and Shafi'i. In our school of thought, you would be a, a muqallid of one of the jurists and mujtahids. If you do not want to be a muqallid, you want to be a mujtahid yes. of your own, you want to be a jurist of your own, you have to study usul al-fiqh, which is a theory that, that equips you with the tools to understand and know how to derive laws. Yes. Uh, these principles and laws, for example, tell us, can we depend on narrations mm -hmm. or not? Uh, can we depend on the apparent meanings of the Qur'an or not? Uh, consensus, yes. ijma, does it have any value or not? The sunnah of Rasulullah, should it be taken or should it not be taken? The sunnah of Ahlul Bayt, their words, their actions, 
uh, their tacit approval should it be considered is it does it have authority or not um, fatwas that are popular shuhra do they have authority or not mm -hmm. qiyas should qiyas be implemented in jurisprudence or not this is all in the science of usul al-fiqh mm -hmm. usul al-fiqh gives us the tools so that when a jurist goes into the original sources to the Quran, to the Sunnah of the Prophet and Ahl bayt he'll be able to derive laws in the correct manner. Mm -hmm. He'll be able to understand what the Quran is trying to say regarding mm -hmm. Islamic laws and what Rasulullah is trying to say regarding Islamic laws. Mm -hmm. Now there's a debate that is Usul al-Fiqh really a theory that actually gives a jurist the ability to derive laws or is it merely a way of justifying laws that already exist? Yes. There are some, there are some that believe, there are some that believe that usul al-fiqh, uh, and I've seen scholars, and you know, uh, I've attended some conferences on, on usul al-fiqh, and I've seen some scholars on usul al-fiqh that believe Usul al-fiqh is only a, a way of justifying laws. For example, for example, mm -hmm. in Islam, uh, Muslims believe that a thief, a thief's hand should be cut off. Hand or the tips of his fingers? Well, this is debatable, mm -hmm. depending on the school of thought. We, the followers of Ahl-Bayt, who believe that the fingers should be cut mm -hmm. off. Some, sc some scholars say that this is a law that is already accepted the science of usul al-fiqh was made to, to justify, justify it. How mm -hmm. do we prove this law? Mm -hmm. How do we prove this? So it's not really an objective science. There is laws, but let's come and justify them. Let's find proof for them. While usul al-fiqh is really meant to be a way of, you know, let's not look at the laws. Let's see how do we derive those laws. And then what is, what is the law that do we arrive at? That's a different story. So Usul al-Fiqh equ equips you with, with how to derive a law. But isn't now what is that law that you arrive at that should not be important? While this, this notion, this mm -hmm. opinion says that no, we've already accepted a set of laws and Usul al-Fiqh, we're only trying to justify them. But isn't that trying the same thing? Because you're arriving at, at for example, uh, take eating specific meat. Some people say that it's halal. Some people say it's makruh. They arrived at different, but yes, some do come to the same point, yet they're both mujtahid. Right. They've, they've both reached that point. This so aren't they justifying the same rule? No. This opinion is stating that we've already accepted Allah. For example, that the meat of Christians and Jews is haram. Now let's find proof. Now let's find evidence for it. Mm -hmm. While usul al-fiqh is actually meant to say that I don't know what the laws are. Let me look at the proof and evidence, and from the proof and evidence, I'll, do, I'll arrive at a law. Mm -hmm. And that law I will accept, whether it says that the meat of Christians and Jews is halal, or it's haram. Or it's haram. Or it's haram. Mm -hmm. This is the objective way. This is, and this is what usul al-fiqh is meant to do. Mm -hmm. Usul al-fiqh is meant to be objective. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what the laws are. That will come at the end. Usul al-fiqh gives you, gives you a bunch of tools. You know, the apparent meanings of the Qur'an, the sunnah, ijma, qiyas, depending on some schools of thought, yes. shuhra. Use these tools to derive laws. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the law that you arrive at, you will have to accept. Don't try to justify that law. In other words, don't pick the law first and then try to find evidence then, for it. No. Look at the evidence and see where the evidence takes you. Mm -hmm. You see? So now, now it makes sense. We see the difference, yes. Yes. We argue for the latter, that we look at the evidence and proof. Mm -hmm. Where it takes us, we will have to accept. We don't choose have the... Have to? Well, yes. If this is proof and evidence that is provided by us, by the Quran and by the Sunnah, mm -hmm. we'll have to accept the ending result. If the ending result is, is such, and su such and so act is haram, We'll have to say that it's haram. Mm -hmm. If we arrive that it's halal, we'll say that it's halal. We don't choose the laws first that, you know, uh, that conform to our taste, mm -hmm. and then we try to find proof and evidence for it. 
for example, there are some that believe music is halal. Mm-hmm. He's come to a conclusion that music is halal. Now he's going to come to the Quran and narrations and twist them to try to prove that yeah. they say what? Music is halal. Mm-hmm. This is not usul al fiqh. This is, this is not objective yeah. usul al fiqh, unbiased usul al fiqh. Usul al fiqh is that you're given tools and you work with those tools objectively without looking at the end. Yes. You look at the proof. You look at the evidence. What does the proof and evidence tell you? Yes. And whatever the end result is, you accept it. You know, it's like, a, let me give you a final example and we'll move on. Mm-hmm. It's like a teacher, a college professor that likes some students, right? Before he looks at the final paper, he reads the names. He reads the names. When he reads that it's his favorite student, right away he's decided that he's going to pass this student. So when he reads the paper, he'll find the good aspects and give a blind eye to the bad aspects of the paper and he'll give a passing rate while this is not an objective teacher definitely an objective teacher should not look at the name of the one who writes the paper should look at the content it then could be his he should look at the content it could be his favorite student or it could be the troublemaker that sits in the back and always makes noise and plays with his phone mm-hmm. and if the content is good he has to give a passing grade definitely. and if his and if the content was bad he has about he has to give an f mm-hmm. even if it's his Favorite student. Favorite student. This is how. This is what usul al fiqh does. It mm-hmm. gives us tools to use to derive Islamic laws. Islamic laws and regulations. Why is it so important today? Mm-hmm. Why is usul al fiqh so important today? Because usul al fiqh gives us the opportunity. It gives us the chance to review certain laws mm-hmm. that previously were taken for granted. Today, Usul al Fiqh gives us a chance to reread certain laws. Allah. Such as? For example, the purity of people of the book, Christians and Jews. Mm-hmm. Are they pure? Are they najis? Yeah. Up till. That's debated. Up till a century ago, less than a century ago, mm-hmm. all scholars said that Christians and Jews are impure. They're najis. Based upon their reading of the Quran and the Sunnah. Today, most scholars are saying the opposite, that Christians and Jews are pure. They're tahir. They're not najis. Mm-hmm. In fact, some are saying that not even Christians and Jews, even mushrikeen, polytheists, even if you worship an idol, you could be considered a tahir. This is a reading. I'm not saying that I support this reading. Mm-hmm. But this is a reading. Why? All thanks to usul al-fiqh. Which one do you support? Uh, <laughs> I... Uh, you know, who am I to give an opinion? Well, definitely. But I mean, from, from I know that you... Based d- on my readings. Based on your readings and... Based and, on my and readings, the, the I traditions. think that saying Christians and Jews are, are pure and tahir, it, 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 it conforms to the Quran and mm-hmm. to the narrations of Ahl al-Bayt. Yes, Actually, I've read that. I've read mar- various scholars and jurists that have stated this and, and yes. you know, superior. Mushrikeen, that's another story. Mm-hmm. It will require more proof and evidence. Yes. There is proof, but it needs it needs to be supported. Mm-hmm. It needs more proof and evidence. My point is that there's a lot of issues today that we could reread them. We could reanalyze them and we could reach different conclusions. Mm-hmm. Different. For example, one of, one of the cases today that we're dealing with, the execution of homosexuals. A person who is caught in a homosexual act. We have come to know that Islam says he must be executed. But is that really the case? Today, perhaps if we reread certain narrations, a scholar could come and say that, for example, this law is not mentioned in the Quran. Mm-hmm. Nowhere in the Quran does it say that a homosexual has to be killed. Mm-hmm. This is one. Two, the narrations, <clears throat> perhaps there was one or two instances in which a homosexual was executed. Does that mean that all homosexuals should be executed in the eyes of Islam? No. So perhaps a jurist can come and reread, reinterpret. What is this narration trying to say? Mm-hmm. Was it a historical event? Should we read it in its, uh, in its context, in a, speci- in a specific historical t- context? Or is it a general narration? This actually happened in history? Were they, were they executed a homosexual? I don't know, but 
there are some narrations that say this homosexual should be executed. Is this narration correct? Is it authentic? Should it mm. be accepted? Uh, is it general? This is all. This all has to do with the usul al-fiqh. But yesterday we talked. All has to do with the usul. Yesterday we talked about repentance. What if this person is a homosexual, but yet he repented? Yes, there are some that have that opinion mm -hmm. that if he has repented, there is no execution. No, I'm saying that even if he hasn't repented, repented yeah, I mean, does he still deserve the deserve capital punishment? This requires a rereading. There are some that can come to the conclusion that no, no, the narrations do not have that. The mm -hmm. the, the the narrations are not general. Mm -hmm that say that every homosexual has to be executed. No, maybe one or two, maybe Spe for, for specific, for specific matters, reasons, maybe for, for treason, reasons, yeah. maybe for it, it spreading depends, disease. Not, yeah. So what I'm trying to say that this all falls into usul al-fiqh. Yes. This shows the importance of usul al-fiqh, mm -hmm. that many laws could be reread, that many laws, uh, you know, that that had a meeting today, if we reread them, they could have mm -hmm. a different meeting. Yes, definitely. So it's a, it, uh, plays a major role and a lot of the principles of usul al-fiqh are found in the holy quran yes they're many, found in the holy quran many. Um, but speaking of capital punishment i know that we we want to move on uh, swiftly but uh capital punishment as as i've read i know i have been to a couple classes in hausa so i derived some information from that that not any person can actually go and do that you know it it, it requires a specific imam Absolutely. a specific leader capital punishment in general, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about homosexuals or treason. In general, yes. In general, capital punishment, which is part of hudud, mm -hmm. the, the punishment system in Islam, it is only done by the imam, infallible imam. Mm -hmm. And right now, because our imam is in occultation, that means hudud are not applied today. Yes, as we see right now, what ISIS is doing, this is this is one too. It has to be in an Islamic system yes. where the economy is Islamic, the military is Islamic, everything is Islamic. The market is Islamic. Everything is Islamic. Mm -hmm. Islamic laws are applied. Then we also apply the penal system. And that is very hard to find today. Very hard. An Islamic system where everything is Islamic. And the head of the government is infallible. This doesn't exist today. It doesn't. And that means that hudud are not applied today. Even cutting the hand of a thief mm -hmm. today it cannot be applied. They have to look at various reasons why, you know, if this, pers if this person is, is uh, need, is, if this person is poor, Absolutely. what led them to, to, to the robbery. Absolutely. And this, so there, there's, there's a lot a of reasons. today that says the hudud, the penal system, the penal code in Islam today mm -hmm. cannot be implemented. There's nowhere in the world that it could be implemented. Well, because of course. the rules and requirements are not, not met, met today. Yeah, they're not, not met. met. But, I mean, moving on to uh, the, the next topic that I want to talk about is that we see the Qur'an indicating in various, uh, various laws uh, that forbid eating, uh, eating pork, drinking alcohol, and so on and so forth. So we do see various laws and regulations within the Holy Qur'an. Uh, but some people state that, you know, due to this, Islam is restricting the people who follow Muslims. And for this reason, they say it's harsh. You know, due to uh, it enforces difficult, you know, obligations upon the believers or upon the Muslims. But this is absolutely not true. Uh, but if we want to talk about uh, scholars who do say no difficulty in religion, while others accuse us for not having any basis in our rulings, they just we derive it from the Sunni school of thought. So that right there, it just raises confusion. Is that we Shia follow a different Usul fiqh, then they follow different usul fiqh because they have various uh, tendencies of, of, of looking at what a, a ruling is or what a law is or what a regulation is. But uh, if we can take a short break and come back to this uh, for providing principles on usul fiqh. So if you all say, Sayyidina, sure. respected viewers, we're going to a short break, inshallah. And uh, after, we're going to talk about various aspects relating to the laws and regulations of Islam. So that's after the break. Stay tuned.
Respected viewers, welcome back. I uh, hope you, inshallah, enjoyed uh, those live footages from uh, our Master's Holy Shrine, Imam Hussain Ali Salam. Uh, but before the break, we provided an introduction to what Usul al Fiqh is. Uh, this was this was discussed with my dear guest Sayyid Hussain Al Qazwini. Welcome back, Hayyub Sayyidna. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, tonight's episode is very beneficial uh, for the house students who are studying and how to derive uh, their uh, their laws or their regulations up to up to the law. Uh, but Sayyidna, before the break, I mentioned something regarding that some state that our laws and regulations usul fiqh science of jurisprudence are derived from the Sunni school of thought. Historically, did the Shia Sul Fiqh derive from the Sunni school of thought? Or is that, you know, something else? This was an accusation made by the Akhbari school of thought. Mm -hmm. Specifically, uh, Mullah Muhammad Amin al-Istirabadi in his book Al-Fawaid al-Madaniyya, he made this accusation against Al-Allam al-Hilli. Uh, Al-Allam al-Hilli was, you know, a giant in the school of, uh, in, uh, in the science of Usul al-Fiqh. He wrote Mabadi al-Usul, Tahdid al-Usul, Nahayat al-Usul. And he incorporated, he brought new things into Usul al-Fiqh. For example, he was the first to divide uh, the categorization of hadith into four. Sahih, Muwathaq, Hasan, and Da'if. Mm -hmm. This this was unpre unprecedented before. Mm -hmm. Before the had the hadith was either considered sahih or da'if. Mm -hmm. Now we saw four categorizations. Four categories. And in the Sunni school of thought, they existed. Mm -hmm. So what the Akhbaris did was say they accused Al Alam Al Hilli of, of immediately taking his usul al fiqh from whom from the Sunni school of thought. They ha they also have four because all I see when we when we try to prove something. They say that's da'if, they don't provide anything no, else. No, they do. They do? Yes, mm -hmm. they do. They have this categorization. Maybe not all of them accept it, but they do. So is our usul al-fiqh all from the Sunni school of thought? Mm -hmm. This has been, uh, this, this accusation has always existed. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, perhaps, that our scholars were motivated mm -hmm. by Sunni usul al-fiqh. Mm -hmm. Perhaps Shia Usul al Fiqh was motivated by Sunni Usul al Fiqh. Perhaps in the beginning it was in conversation with Sunni Usul al Fiqh. Mm -hmm. Shia jurists were responding to Sunni Usul al Fiqh, so they came up with Shia Usul al Fiqh. Yes. Uh, we are told that the first who wrote on Shia Usul al Fiqh was Sheikh al Mufid in yes. his Al Tadkira. Mm -hmm. And then Sheikh al Tusi in his Al Udda. And then Sayyid al Murtaba in his Al Dari'a. And so on and so forth. They were in conversation with Sunni Usul al Fiqh. But this doesn't mean that the origin of Shia Usul al Fiqh Sunni. was Sunni Usul al Fiqh. And even if it was, even if Shia Usul al Fiqh was motivated by Sunni Usul al Fiqh. I mean, they're both derived from the Quran. They're both derived from the Quran. Shia Usul al Fiqh, at least. To say that it's derived from the Quran. Mm -hmm. And even Sunni Usul al Fiqh, many of their principles, many of their Usul, they derive it back to the Quran. But did, but did they understand the Quran correctly or not? Mm -hmm. That's another story. That's another story. They even claim that Qiyas has its roots yes. in the Quran, mm -hmm. depending on their reading. But mm -hmm. when we come to the Quran, we see no, on the contrary. On the contrary. Quran refutes Qiyas. Mm -hmm. I mean, analogy, speaking of Qiyas, yes. it's something out of the four sources. Of Al Hanafi, uh, where he says the book, the Sunnah, uh, consensus and analogy. Analogy and analogies is forbidden. And in, in the Shafi'i school of in thought. In the Shafi'i as well as in in, in the Hanbali, uh, but not so much in the Hanbali as much as Shafi'i. Right. But I mean, that doesn't that, that's not even stated in the Quran. Analogy, you know, that's something back to our human minds. Right. You know, you can't if if you actually want to take analogy into into perspective. Half in of the fact, stuff that we think of is wrong. In fact, the Quran gives us a general principle that says, well, That presumption will not let you reach the truth. And that's what they believe in. Yes, because analogy is... It's it an assumption. Get, it's an assumption. They say that this subject matter has this law. 
this subject matter is close to that subject matter. They're very close. So this subject matter has to have Connection the same law. Or the same law. It has to have the same law. Because they're similar, these two look alike. Mm -hmm. If this has a law, this has to have the same law. طيب. All that gives me is a presumption. Yeah. It gives me an assumption, <coughs> conjecture. Yes. That it has the same law. But it doesn't give me qat. It doesn't give me knowledge and certainty that this indeed has the same law as this. Yeah. And the Quran says, Inna la min al Can you provide an example of that? Uh, sure. Uh, um, for example, for example, urine is considered najis. Mm -hmm. Blood is also considered najis. If a person during his salah, he, you know, uh, 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 secrete, uh, you know, um, he, urine comes out during salah. Mm -hmm. The salah is what? Batil. It's void. Urine is najis. What about blood? Blood is also najis. Najis, if, if we can terminology, means? Impure. Impure. If blood comes out during salah as well, someone bleeds in the middle mm -hmm. of salah, is the salah void? No. They say yes. The, well, yeah, of course. To them because that yes. is qiyas. That is yeah, analogy. They, they, they because blood and urine are the same. <coughs> so if a person secretes urine during salah, his, his salah is void. Mm -hmm. So the same is with blood. You see, that's analogy. Mm -hmm. That gives me an assumption that during salah, if you bleed, your salah is batal. It doesn't give me knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the Quran is saying, in the la yugni min al haqq al And this is a general law. When you come to Islamic law and deriving an Islamic law, you have to have certainty. Yes. The tool that you use, it must, you have to have certainty. It gives you certainty in order to derive an Islamic law. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if it's just conjectures, of, if it's just assumptions, mm -hmm. if it's just presumptions, mm -hmm. then it's not, it's not applicable. Mm -hmm. Now that we've cleared that up, if we can talk about examples of the principles of Usul Fiqh, if you can provide some, that would be great. Sure. Um, there are several principles uh, in Usul Al Fiqh that are applied. Mm -hmm. uh, the roots are found in the Quran. Mm -hmm. For example, Hujjiyat Khabar Al Wahid, which is, which is the uh, the re uh, reliability on a truth telling person mm -hmm. the ability to rely on someone who's truth telling and is reliable and doesn't lie mm -hmm. we could rely on him to transmit a hadith of the prophet or ahlul bayt how did the narrations of the prophet and ahlul bayt reach us but how do you assume this person is trustworthy huh that's another story. Mm -hmm. We have to prove that he's reliable. Mm -hmm. We have to prove that he's reliable and trustworthy. Here, scholars of Asul Fiqh say that we can rely on him. Mm -hmm. So if so-and-so comes and says that I heard the Prophet say that, for example, uh, Salatul Subh is two units, mm -hmm. not three, and not one. We could rely on him. If you know, it's a chain yes. because we we don't see Rasulullah now. We don't. We're not living at his time. It's a chain of narrators. Each one says that I heard this person tell me that that person told me that that person told me that Rasulullah stated so and so. Yes. This is a chain of akhbar ahad. Who said that we could rely on them? Mm -hmm. There's a verse in the Quran. Yes. In ja'akum fasiqun binabain fatabayyin. If someone wicked or a, a liar mm -hmm. brings you news, do not accept that piece of news. Definitely. Meaning what? You have to go and check for its certainty. Uh, it means that if, the verse is saying, if someone, if a liar gives you a piece of news, do not depend on it. So that means if someone who's not a liar, someone who's trustworthy, someone who's depend reliable, on it. gives you a piece of news, you could rely on it. This means, إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ عَادِلٌ إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ بِنَبَئٍ فَلَا تَتَبَيُّنُ If someone who is reliable gives you a piece of news, you don't need to check. Mm -hmm. You can rely on it. This is a principle in Usul al-Fiqh. Yes. In fact, this is one of the most important <coughs> principles of Usul al-Fiqh, that we could rely on trustworthy people, mm -hmm. truth-telling people. 
if we did if we could not rely on truth telling people we would not have a system of jurisprudence we wouldn't our system of jurisprudence is based upon mostly on what narrations yes a hadith of mm. the prophet and his holy household another principle of jurisprudence all religions are not just islam all religions because yes. if you look at it john matthew they're, they're narr narrations they're, they're, they're just narratives another very important uh, principle of jurisprudence mm -hmm. is asalatul bara'a mm -hmm. bara al mm -hmm. which states that everything by nature is halal unless proven otherwise unless proven otherwise everything by nature is lawful unless proven otherwise. unlawful this is very important mm -hmm. this is a very important principle because it's telling us that everything is lawful yes. unless though unless the things that we have been told are unlawful either stated in the Quran or mentioned in a narration or there's a consensus. Uh, in fact, this, this principle makes life a lot easier because if it was the opposite, if everything was unlawful unless proven lawful, oh, wow. life would have been a living a hell. <laughs> it would have been a misery, it would have been miserable. While Islam makes it easier. Where can we you know, find proof Ev ev an evidence yes. for this principle mm -hmm. uh, for example Allah will not obligate a person except with that which he has given him so if he's given a, a group of laws a set of laws he will judge him according to those laws he will not judge him according to laws that he has not received mm -hmm. meaning what you're told what to do and what not to do you'll be judged according to that but mm -hmm. things that you're you were not told are you required mm -hmm. are you obligated to act regarding things that you were not told what to do regarding them mm -hmm. no same as the servant and the prayer rug to some degree to some degree uh, f for example mm -hmm. smoking smoking mm -hmm. we, we were not told whether smoking is halal or haram. Mm -hmm. What's the Islamic ruling? The Islamic ruling is al uh, uh, al-bara'a al 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 mm -hmm. or asalat al-hil that everything by nature is lawful. Because we were told what to do regarding salah, fasting, eating, certain things, but the things that we were not told about, Allah will not hold us accountable. La yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa ma ataha we will be held accountable on the things that we were told about. Mm -hmm. The things that we were now told about will not be held accountable. So how come jurists, speaking of smoking, how come jurists, um, you know, say that this is unlawful? The act of smoking Most jurists do not say that smoking is unlawful. Some say, based on their reading of certain narrations and certain verses. Mm -hmm. Based on a reading. You know, that's the beauty of Islam. That's the beauty of ijtihad. The door of, uh, of deriving laws. It's based upon readings. How you understand. Your understanding of the Quran might not be the same as my understanding of the mm -hmm. Quran. We'll read the same narration. You'll understand the narration in one way. I'll understand it in another way. And Allah will judge us according to our understandings. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty about it. طيب. In another narration, uh, I'm sorry, in another verse, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولَ we will not punish a group of people unless we send a messenger for them to deliver the message. So if you, are, if you haven't been delivered the message, Allah will not hold you accountable. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that smoking has a ruling, yes. that it's either halal or haram. But since I don't know about the ruling, I will not be held accountable. Whatever it is that you don't know the ruling on, of course, after doing your research, not before doing your research, after you've done your research and you haven't found a ruling, you haven't found a narration, a verse, Regarding that subject matter, you will not be held accountable. Mm -hmm. This is called Asalat al Bara'a. We have Asalat al Ihtiyat. Asalat al Ihtiyat, which was backed by the Akhbaris, mm -hmm. they say that on the contrary, we have to be cautious in everything. Everything by default is haram, everything by default is unlawful, mm -hmm. unless proven lawful so they have they switched it they switched it or they say that everything by default is mandatory unless proven not mandatory 
So if there's something that you assume could be mandatory, then you should consider it mandatory and obligatory unless proven that it's not. They support their arguments by some verses. Ittaqullaha haqqa tuqatil. Be pious of Allah to, to the best of levels. Haqqa tuqatil. Fattaqullaha mastata'atum. Be pious of Allah as much as you can. Some akhbaris say that this means that uh, anything that you assume, you assume is haram, consider it haram. Anything that you assume is mandatory, consider it mandatory. Don't, ju don't just sit there and say that, well, I don't know. I, don't know I didn't know that this is haram. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that this is wajib. No, yes. act upon it. Mm -hmm. If you assume that it's haram, consider it haram. If you assume that it's mandatory, consider it mandatory. Consider it mandatory. Of course, here in this program, we're not reaching conclusions. This is, you know, this program is not meant to say we're, that mm -hmm. who's right, who's wrong. We're is letting the viewers. Yeah, we're just to decide. We're what just uh, not even that. We're, you know, we're trying to make the case that the principles of usul al fiqh can be found in the Quran. There's a basis for the usul al fiqh in the Quran. Well, we didn't get them from Greek mythology or Greek Definitely philosophy not. or. We, we imported, we imported Usul al-Fiqh. No, Usul al-Fiqh has basis in the Quran. The Sunnah of Rasulullah. Is the Sunnah of Rasulullah, does the Sunnah of Rasulullah, does the Sunnah of Rasulullah have authority? Meaning that if something is proven to be the Sunnah of Rasulullah, are we, is it binding upon us to mm -hmm. act according to it or not? There are some verses that say yes, that take the Sunnah of Rasulullah, Ya ladina amanu, Allah wa atiyul Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Prophet. This means that anything that the Prophet says mm -hmm. is binding. Yes. Anything that is proven to be part of the Sunnah of Rasulullah is binding. Ma atakum Rasul wa ma nahakum anhu fantahu. Anything that the Prophet orders you, do it. Anything that the Prophet forbids you from doing, don't do it. Mm -hmm. This is basically telling us that the Sunnah of Rasulullah is binding. Mm -hmm. That's part of Usul al-Fiqh. If we prove that this is the Sunnah of Rasulullah, then we use it in Usul al-Fiqh. If we discover that uh, so-and-so was the Sunnah of Rasulullah, this has results in Fiqh. Yes. So, certain things will become mandatory. Absolutely. Other things will be uh, forbidden yes. based on the Sunnah of Rasulullah. Um, also, also, um, the narrations of Ahlul Bayt, are they binding? If the Ahlul Bayt said something, for example, if one of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt says, do this or don't do that, is this binding? Mm -hmm. is, does it have an authority? Does it have a hujjia mm -hmm. or not? We, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we say yes. We believe that every action that they do, they stand up, they sit down. Every act that they do, they speak or silence is, is, uh, is an action of obligatory upon them. And they should be obeyed. Yes. And Ahlul Bayt should be obeyed. While in the Sunni school of thought, the Sunnah of Ahlul Bayt has no significance. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're considered pious scholars, but are their sayings binding? Is their Sunnah binding? Is it Hujjah? Can it be applied in Usul al Fiqh? Can it be applied in jurisprudence? No. While we uh, can argue in the Quran mm -hmm. that there is the basis, there's basis for saying that the Sunnah of Ahlul Bayt is binding. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ الرَّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرَ That you, the family of uh, Rasulullah, you've been purified. You are sinless. Now, if we prove that the Ahl al-Bayt are sinless, as we did in yes, previous lectures, if we prove that they are sinless, mm -hmm. that means anything that they say is not a lie. Definitely. So if they say this is wajib, this is mandatory, and that is forbidden, that means they're not lying. Yes. That means they should be taken. Mm -hmm. They should be obeyed. So my point is, my point is at the end that Usul al-Fiqh has not been imported. Yes, perhaps it was motivated by Sunni uh, Usul al-Fiqh. Perhaps our early scholars, they were in conversation mm -hmm. with Sunni Usul al-Fiqh and Sunni scholars. You know, our scholars, they were in Baghdad. Baghdad was a major university. Yes. It was a major academic city. You had Sunni scholars, you had Shia scholars, you had top scholars in that city. And they would visit one another 
They would speak to one another. Mm -hmm. They would dialogue. Unfortunately, it's not what we see today. Yeah, it was different back then. Back then, it was different. They would meet, they would dialogue, they would have discussions. Uh, Peaceful discussions. Yes. As Sayyid al Murtaba, as Sheikh al Mufid, they would meet with Qadi Abdul Jabbar, yes. the famous Sunni scholar, uh, the Mu'tazili scholar. Qadi Abdul Jabbar would meet with Al Mufid. They would discuss ideas. Uh, Al Mufid would refute the ideas of Qadi Abdul Jabbar in his class. Qadi Abdul Jabbar would refute the ideas of, of Al Mufid in his class. And this is how they, they uh, this is how academia flourished. This is how knowledge flourished at the time. Mm -hmm. Today we don't have, we don't have that. In Al Azhar, Al Azhar has been cut off from Najaf. Najaf has been cut off from Al Azhar. Uh, we don't know about the discussions that are taking place in Al Azhar, and in Al Azhar they don't know about the discussions that are taking place in Karbala and in Najaf and in Qom. Mm -hmm. And that's very unfortunate. We have allowed sectarian, sectarian yes. lines to to divide. And this is academia. This should have nothing to do with. With sectarianism, it doesn't. I mean, both parties are deriving the same rules from the Holy Quran. I mean, the Quran doesn't speak of fifty voices; it's one clear voice that this is forbidden, this is halal, and up to the jurists to derive. Uh, it's I, I, I would think of, of sub rulings to the actual ruling, because if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants something to be haram, He would have clearly stated in the Holy Quran. But yet, these are just you know along the side. If you want to commit those, it's, it's, it's either forbidden, halal, or ihtiyat, or mustahab. Uh, but Sayyidina, uh, finally, I would like to talk about uh, the difference between the true Islamic laws and regulations and what is so-called Sharia law that supposedly uh, exists, but no one has ever seen it before or read it. Mm. I mean, this, this theory of Sharia law, I think it's the reason for... 99% of the reason behind the corruption, Islamophobia, Islamophobia the killing of, of Muslims, uh, the, the abandoning of Muslims, the reaction that we see from non-Muslims to Muslims is because of this, this, this so-called Sharia Allah. Does it exist? Does it not exist? What they mean by Sharia Allah in the West is killing an apostate, killing a homosexual, cutting off the hand of a thief, uh, stoning a person who commits adultery, which are called hudud, mm -hmm. which capital we are called punishment. capital punishment or hudud, pun the penal system. Uh, yes. First of all, we said that uh, we said two things in the beginning. That number one, today the penal system, the hudud system, is not applicable mm -hmm. because the rules and requirements are not met today. Mm -hmm. They have to be either applied during the time of the Prophet or an infallible Imam during the time of an infallible person today we don't have an infallible person to execute the penal system mm -hmm. the penal code so Sharia law as they call it is not applicable today to to what is happening what is used by Daesh and ISIS and what they're what they're what they're doing uh, this is this is un-Islamic. This is not how Islam says that the law should be implemented. Not not at the hands of thugs yeah. and gang members. This is not Islam. Islam has rules, conditions. <coughs> Some things are taken out of context. Mm -hmm. I said that many of these laws we have to reread them. We have to see what context they were in. Mm -hmm. But isn't the Sharia sh sh law derived from these? Laws or regulations? Yes, yes, they are. But, but we have to reread. They're taken to an extreme extent. They're taken to extreme extent, or they're not even applied correctly. They shouldn't be applied. Mm -hmm. Today is not a time for penal, for the penal code to be applied yeah. because of the because the infallible Imam is not present. has not made himself available. Yes. He's not present. So many of these laws are not applicable. For the, even if they were to be applicable, we have to reread them. We have to look at the context. Yes. When is it that these laws should be applied, and under what rules, what what circumstances? The ones that the people that are talking about Sharia ah law, they make a big deal out of it. Uh, the, first of all, they're ignorant to say the least mm -hmm. about Sharia ah law, and second, they're using it as a card to to scare the West yes. from from Islam, definitely, and, and to spread a fear of 
uh, Islam or Islamophobia. Definitely. Thank you very much, Zainab, for joining us tonight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, shed his blessings, mercy, and forgiveness upon likewise, you and likewise. your family My members. Uh, respective viewers, thank you very much for tuning in tonight. Uh, it's important, actually, if you didn't get the chance to view the whole episode, uh, to go back and you know view it once again to see how laws and regulations in Islam are derived and where are they derived from and to see is, is the killing of, of any human being or cutting off a hand of any human being is it lawful in Islam or is there restrictions which are bounded upon that act so respected viewers thank you very much for tuning in wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Allahumma salli ala Muhammad